Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're glad to have you along with us. Also happy to be joined this afternoon by the Mayor of London, Mayor Ed Holder, the, medical, the Acting Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Alex Summers, and the Chief Medical Officer at London Health Sciences Centre, Dr. Adam Duclo. Happy to have the members of the media along with us this afternoon as well. And just a reminder, if you do have questions to ask, uh, you can just click on the text bubble with the question mark inside it here on Microsoft Teams. And when you do, if you could indicate your name as well as your media outlet and who your question is for. And finally, a welcome to folks who are tuning in on Rogers Television as well as the Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel this afternoon. And those who are watching us on the CTV London website. Let's begin with the opening remarks. We'll start today with Mayor Ed Holt. Mayor Holt. Well, thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. It's been a while since we've had an update on enforcement of COVID protocols. And while the need for enforcement is lessened as restrictions are loosened, that doesn't mean enforcement isn't still taking place. Uh, for example, over the weekend, bylaw enforcement officers participated in a multi-ministry blitz. A number of premises were inspected, including numerous restaurants. And while very high compliance was generally observed, I'd say some charges are pending. Separate from that, late last week, two charges were issued, both against restaurants. One for not actively implementing a proof of vaccination protocol and the other uh, for restaurant staff not being masked. So they are being vigilant, they are paying attention, but more importantly for the health and safety of all, we ask businesses to please, please keep mind. Needless to say though, even with far fewer restrictions in place compared to this time last year, it's not the time to get lazy not with case counts across Ontario, surging to nearly 1,000 infections per day, nearly 1,000 infections per day, and not with the arrival certainly of a new variant. Where that new variant is concerned, there's still much more that we don't know compared to what we do. However, one of the things we do know is that our best protection against any variant identified thus far remains vaccinations and wearing masks if you're around large crowds indoors. While we wait to learn more about the Omicron variant, there are things we can and things we should be doing right now. If you're the parent of a child five to 11, and you know this, do what thousands in our region have thankfully already done. Book a time to get your little ones vaccinated today. And if you're someone who's eligible for a booster shot, don't wait, do it now. And if you're among the one in 10, in London, Middlesex, who have still not received a single COVID shot. Well, I don't know what to say, except that I hope that you'll reconsider. As Dr. Summers has quite rightly said in the past, given how contagious we know the Delta strain to be and the potential for even greater transmi transmissibility with new variants, if you're unvaccinated, it's not a matter of if you'll become infected, it's a matter of when. The choice at this stage is vaccine or COVID. Really, really simple. No third option. If you compare the safety of the vaccine compared to the outcomes associated with COVID, again, no comparison. So make the right choice, then make an appointment to get your first shot today. Over to you, Dr. Summers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and for those comments and the ongoing emphasis on the importance of vaccine and the choice that is before all of us, um, which is COVID or vaccine. It is that simple. Speaking of the vaccine, we had a successful first weekend uh, vaccinating our youngest superheroes, our 5 to 11 year olds. Uh, we've been delighted to see a tremendous uptake in both booking appointments and showing up to get vaccinated. Um, to date, uh, over 10,000 appointments for kids have been made, 25%, just over 25% of the pediatric population, 5 to 11, uh, has booked an appointment. Um, so we are seeing tremendous uptake. And over the weekend, those kids got their vaccine, many of them. Uh, things went very well at the mass vaccination clinics. Uh, we saw the look and finds in good use, the squishy stars in good use, and lots of smiles after the fact for uh, a job well done. Appointments are still available and we strongly encourage any parent or guardian out there uh, to make your appointment as soon as possible. 
um, as we head into the holiday season and as we see case counts rise across the province uh, now more than ever it remains a priority to get vaccinated and as the mayor noted for those who have not yet received a first or second dose of any age uh, please make an appointment as soon as possible at one of our mass vaccination sites or at uh, a participating pharmacy or through a participating primary care practitioner. It really, really remains absolutely critical. Folks would have heard, um, of course, uh, coming on Friday and through the weekend, uh, announcements and news about the Omicron variant. Uh, the first few cases of Omicron were identified in Ontario uh, just within the last 24 to 48 hours. We have not had any reports of Omicron in our region to date. The Delta strain remains the predominant strain of concern in our region. We worry about variants for three reasons. One, is it more infectious or transmissible than any other variant? With Omicron early indications out of South Africa and, and early evidence of transmission in Europe suggests that it very well could be more transmissible than previous variants. It is out competing the Delta variant uh, quite pronounceably uh, in South Africa. The second reason we worry about variants uh, is due to the severity of the illness that those variants might cause. Um, as it stands, we're not entirely sure yet uh, whether or not Omicron causes more severe outcomes or not. The third reason is whether or not the vaccine remains effective against these variant strains. And again, we're still waiting on more information with regards to Omicron and the ongoing effectiveness of our vaccines against this variant. The variants to date have still been uh, effective and have still been uh, responsive to the vaccines and we hope that remains the case. Um, however, again, we're paying close attention to that as we know that this certain variant has a number of mutations uh, which are of concern. The question of course is what does that mean for us here? What does that mean for us living in the Middlesex and London region? At this time, no dramatic changes are required except to remember and be ongoingly vigilant with the ongoing public health measures and personal protective measures that we've taken this far. Get vaccinated. It is the most important thing you can do to prevent yourself from getting infected, protect those around you, or prevent yourself from ending up in hospital or ICU. Continue to mask with great gusto Wear that mask in any indoor environment. Wear it when you're out in public. Wear it with your people who are not in your household. That mask is an important barrier for you against the virus as well as to others from you if you were ever infected. And keep physical distancing where you can. The holiday season is approaching and with that an increasing number of gatherings with family and friends. Unfortunately, it's happening as we see the arrival of a new variant in our, re in our province. It's happening at the same time that we see increasing case counts across the province and here in the Middlesex London region. I'm increasingly concerned about this. The current provincial regulation and rules limit gatherings of 25 for indoor social gatherings. And it's absolutely critical that you don't go beyond that number. I would also actually encourage you to keep that number smaller. Uh, jurisdictions like Kingston have recently moved to limit social gathering capacity limits to 10 people indoors. We are not going there yet, but as we see cases rise, I would strongly encourage folks to consider limiting your indoor gathering size as much as possible. And if you are having an indoor gathering with anybody who is not in your household, make sure everybody there is vaccinated. These are the key steps that you can take to limit transmission in our region, particularly as we head into the holiday season. We will be watching the rates in our region very closely. Transmission right now is happening predominantly still amongst those that are unvaccinated and is happening in social and casual environments. So we need to watch that very closely. We'll keep you posted, of course, as things change, but in the meantime, as we come closer and closer to December 1st, please consider keeping those social gatherings a little bit smaller this holiday season. With that, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Dr. Ducolo from London Health Sciences Center. Thank you, Dan, Mayor Holder and Dr. Summers. Uh, as of this morning, our hospitals are caring for 18 COVID-19 positive inpatients. Eight of those patients are in critical care. There are five or fewer uh, COVID inpatients in our children's hospital. 
As an acute care uh, teaching hospital, we serve a large region. And although London is still doing relatively well, uh, surrounding areas are seeing a larger increase in cases, especially in communities with lower vaccination rates. The increases we are seeing in our inpatient numbers are reflective of the rise in cases across the province. It is as or more important than ever to follow the advice Dr. Summers just provided to prevent catching and or spreading COVID. On the subject of vaccination, we know that many parents, families and children have been eager to get vaccinated, including those with differing needs. And I'm pleased to share that starting tomorrow, our Children's Hospital COVID vaccination clinic will begin appointments for five to 11 year olds with significant needle fears, generalized general anxiety, developmental needs or sensory needs. This expands the clinic's current offering beyond those who are in the 12 to 17 age group to include those that are five plus. At this time, appointments can be booked for Tuesday evenings through the Middlesex London Health Unit booking portal. This unique vaccination clinic will serve 14 children per evening, allowing extra time for youth with behavioral needs to be vaccinated and providing a low stimulation and private environment for those who have sensory needs. The clinic also offers tools to assist in developing a coping plan to ease anxiety including distraction techniques for younger children. Families can also request a pre-appointment phone call with the vaccination team for support in developing a plan and for answers to any questions they may have. Lastly, I want to congratulate our new permanent CEO, Dr. Jackie Schleifer-Taylor on her recent appointment. Having had the pleasure of working with Jackie quite closely as our interim CEO, I am confident our board of directors has made the right decision in selecting her to lead the next chapter for LHSC and the community we serve. I look forward to continuing our pandemic response and our future post-recovery efforts under Jackie's ongoing leadership. Thank you to our media partners for attending today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Duclo, Dr. Summers, and Mayor Holder. We do have a number of questions in the queue already, so let's get into those right away. The first question, Dr. Summers, is for you. And it comes to us this afternoon from Jane Sims at the London Free Press. Jane asks, this provincial government is hinting it will have an announcement by the end of the week about speeding up the timetable on third dose boosters. How quickly could MLHU adapt to that possible policy change and increase capacity at mass vaccination centers? Would it slow down the children's immunization campaign? Thanks for that question, Jane. Uh, yes, we look to the province for the ongoing approval around the eligibility of booster doses uh, for different populations. Um, if there is an announcement near the end of the week of expanded eligibility for boosters, um, certainly in our region, I think there is capacity between mass vaccination clinics and pharmacies uh, to handle that surge. Um, we will be prioritizing first and second doses for all age groups, um, but obviously for children five to 11, we have separate appointment types. So we're actually able to reserve appointment types for five to 11 year olds. So even as uh, booster doses get approved, uh, we will be prioritizing availability and prioritizing the number of appointments for five to 11 year olds to make sure that everybody who wants a shot uh, and a first and second dose in that age cohort is able to get it. Um, so we're, I think as a region prepared, uh, the pharmacies I would imagine will be playing even a bigger role as they transition out of their influenza campaigns, potentially into booster dose campaigns for COVID. Uh, but as a region, I think we're in a good stead to uh, absorb those booster dose capacity. And no, I do not believe it would slow down our children immunization campaign uh, because it remains the priority and we have separate appointments for them. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. And a follow-up question for you from Jane Sims. And it touches on, I think, the subject of the day. Uh, Dr. Summers, has there been any evidence that the Omicron variant is in the region? How quickly would the health unit be alerted if there is a case in London or Middlesex County? Uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, the Public Health Ontario Laboratory is doing whole genome sequencing as well as screening of all samples at this time to determine whether or not they're Omicron or not. Um, so we would be notified through the Public Health Ontario Laboratory system if one of our lab results from our region screened positive um, and subsequently uh, was sequenced positive as well. Uh, we have not had any reports at this time. Um, uh, we do think obviously in time that will make its way here, just like all the other strains have in time made their way to our region, uh, but we do not have evidence at this time. We would know uh, because of the screening protocols associated with checking the samples, we would know fairly rapidly. The whole genome sequencing can take a little bit longer, but there's a first step screening that would allow for us to know fairly quickly. 
Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. Dr. Summers, this one is for you as well. And it's from Jacqueline LaBelle at Global News Radio 980 CFPL. Uh, Dr. Summers, there's a lot that we still don't know about Omicron. What is the concern locally and what is the health unit doing to prepare? Uh, thanks for that question, Jacqueline. I think the concern about Omicron locally is the same concern that every other region would have. When you introduce a more infectious version of the COVID-19 virus, uh, that potentially is uh, not impacted as dramatically by our vaccine. That's of concern. But we need to get more information. Um, I think the prudent response in any jurisdiction, including ours, is to come back to our basic principles around preventing COVID-19 transmission get vaccinated, wear a mask indoors, keep those social gatherings small. Frankly, the greatest concern right now for me, for our region, is that even in the absence of Omicron, Delta driven only, we are seeing a gradual rise in cases and that rise of cases is being seen across the province. We're seeing over a thousand cases in our region up from 300 to 400 not so long ago. And that's not because of Omicron, that's because of Delta. So we have other reasons to be ever vigilant and getting back to the basics of COVID-19 control, which is why, again, as you're thinking of gathering indoors this holiday season, it's really important that anybody you're indoors with is vaccinated and that you're keeping those gatherings as small as you are able. I want to applaud our operators in our region, be it restaurants or other facilities, uh, for adhering and following through on their commitment to checking vaccination status for entry into those areas. Ensuring that people are vaccinated in those public settings is absolutely critical. And I really applaud our operators for making it happen. We now have to do it at home. We have to do it in our informal social environments. We have to follow through on the commitment of our operators in our region for making sure that those around us are vaccinated. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. And a follow up from Jacqueline LaBelle. Uh, the first few days of vaccinating kids between the ages of five and 11 are now in the books. Uh, do we know how many children from this age group were vaccinated since Friday? Uh, thanks for that question, Jacqueline. We'll have updated information on uh, the number of vaccines administered to this group uh, for tomorrow morning, uh, as done in our whole region. Um, the Agriplex was the predominant site for vaccinating 5 to 11 year olds from Friday through till today, um, and it probably did uh, 2,000 to 3,000 vaccines for that age bracket. Again, we'll get an updated number tomorrow, uh, but a tremendous uptake. Uh, we're booked right through until Thursday. There are appointments for Thursday, Friday, and into next weekend for five to 11 year olds. Um, and as I mentioned, we're over 10,000 kids that have appointments booked uh, in our region or booked or have received the vaccine already. Well, and, and this next question from Jacqueline uh, flows quite nicely into what you just mentioned. Uh, now that vaccination is open to those five years of age and older, will the vaccination coverage data be updated to show the percentage of the local population vaccinated that's five and older instead of 12 and older? Yeah, great question, Jacqueline. We'll actually give you the option. So we'll be presenting both five and older and 12 and older on our dashboard for the next while um, so that you're able to see exactly what's happening. So that will be updated tomorrow. Let's go now to some questions we have from Ashley Goveas at the Western Gazette. Uh, Dr. Summers, are there any updates from the outbreak in Western's residence at Saugeen Maitland Hall? Did any additional students test positive in the outbreak? Um, so the outbreak at Saugeen Maitland Hall um, continues to evolve. Uh, that's transmission amongst no and close contacts in that residence. Um, we may see some additional cases over the next little while, um, but it uh, certainly have had great communication with um, Western about this ongoing outbreak and hopefully we can see it under control here shortly. And sorry, Dan, I'm trying to find that question in the chat, so I hope I answered everything because I only was, got one from Ashley. I don't know where the other one went. Yeah, it was actually a little bit below that. And uh, I'll just go back to it for you, Dr. Summers. Let me move that uh, back. And um, actually, I don't think I can. So again, any updates about the outbreak and did any additional students test positive in the outbreak? Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. I missed the, uh, the question there. Um, so our current case count is up to eight for that outbreak at this time. And again, we may see some additional cases as we're still early on in the investigation. 
And now we'll get to Ashley's follow-up question, which was, does the risk of transmission in first year classes at Western remain low or should the community be wary of spread in areas frequented by first year students? Yeah, the, the overall transmission that we've seen among post-secondary students in our community has been very low and that's because of the exceptionally high vaccination rate amongst post-secondary students in our community uh, because of those uh, policy decisions that were made back in the summer. Um, the transmission that has been seen is really from social interactions, close environments for an extended period of time uh, where masks aren't being worn for, for obvious reasons. Um, so we have not seen evidence of transmission within a classroom or lecture hall environment at this time. Um, the vac combination of vaccination, masking, um, and a relatively short time together in those settings makes them fairly low risk for transmission on the whole, and certainly that's what we've seen to date. All right, let's go to our next question. Uh, it comes to us from Craig Needles at Blackburn News. Dr. Summers, this one's for you as well. Uh, Dr. Summers, are you able to say how many cases in this weekend's count are related to the outbreak at Merlin Hall, which is the residence at Fanshawe College? Uh, thanks for that question, Craig. Um, from the latest numbers I have, three cases have been associated with that Fanshawe College outbreak. Uh, so three cases are the latest numbers that I have. Again, we may see a few more cases as this investigation is still fairly new, um, but three cases at this time associated with that Fanshawe College. All right, we do have a couple of questions left in the queue. So this will be my, my uh, advice to the members of the media who are still thinking about submitting a question. Now would be the time. We know there's a bit of a delay between when you hear us and when you actually are able to submit those questions. So if you do have a question you have not yet asked, now would be the time to get that one in for Dr. Summers, Dr. Duplo, or for Mayor Holder. Uh, let's go to the next question. Dr. Duplo, this one is for you. It comes to us from Jacqueline LaBelle at Global News Radio 980 CFPL. Uh, Dr. Duplo, how many inpatients currently at LHSC are from outside of London and Middlesex County? Thanks for the question, Jacqueline. Uh, over the past four weeks, approximately one third of our COVID positive inpatients have been from London, while the other two thirds have been from outside of London and that's reflected in our current inpatient numbers. If you wanted an exact count, we could follow up with our communications team. And as this group likely knows, patients from outside London come to us and are transferred to us for a number of reasons. Uh, some present to our emergency departments directly. Uh, we also accept tra transfers from healthcare partners that are facing capacity challenges. And we also see patients from outside the city who need more specialized levels of care. So thanks for the question. Thank you very much. And the next question, Dr. Duplo, I think is also for you. It comes from Jerry Dewan at CTV London. St. Thomas Elgin General Hospital officials have confirmed that four COVID-19 patients from that hospital have been transferred to LHSC hospitals in the last two weeks. With Southwestern Public Health expected to announce new gathering restrictions tomorrow, how vital is it from the LHSC's perspective to take measures to increase vaccine uptake and limit virus spread. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Jerry. So I'll start by saying I'm not a public health expert like Dr. Summers or like the Southwest Public Health Unit's Dr. Locke. However, I, like many of us, have learned over the course of the pandemic that public health measures work. Increased distancing, limiting gathering sizes, mask use and vaccine uptake all decrease transmission and ultimately decrease those that end up in our hospitals or even uh, d uh, dying from COVID. I fully support Dr. Locke uh, increasing public health measures if her and her colleagues believe that they are necessary to limit spread and ultimately save save lives. Thank you, Dr. Duplo. And uh, I see Dr. Summers nodding. I wonder, Dr. Summers, if you have any other comments that you'd like to add. I just highlight that uh, public health measures um, and restrictions have played a critical role in controlling community transmission broadly. Uh, particularly in instances where uh, health care capacity has been strained. Um, as individuals will remember back in uh, the spring and in through the winter, winter and late spring of last year through wave two and wave three, uh, here locally it was public health restrictions that helped to ensure that our health care system wasn't completely overwhelmed, although as Dr. Duclo can attest to, things were certainly strained. Um, they play a very, very important role. Um, and as we see cases rise across the province and certainly rise across our region, uh, we'll have to watch uh, that trend very closely and consider what measures are appropriate. I would highlight that it is truly transmission that is starting amongst individuals that are unvaccinated 
And so public health measures will largely need to focus on how we limit potential transmission between unvaccinated individuals um, as we move forward. Let's go to our next question. And this one is from Matthew Trevithick at Global News Radio 980 CFPL, Dr. Summers. Matthew would like to know if there's any information as to how those impacted by the Fanshawe and Western outbreaks may have contracted COVID. Have there been any possible secondary or tertiary cases identified? Um, thanks for that question, Matthew. Uh, the transmission uh, that has been seen in the Fanshawe and Western outbreaks over the weekend uh, happened uh, largely from social interactions, indoors, no masks, social environments. Um, and uh, that is where largely transmission is being seen, whether you're a post-secondary student or not. Um, so it, no surprises in the transmission patterns that we're seeing uh, in those outbreaks. Um, in terms of secondary and tertiary cases identified at this time, um, not at this time. Again, these outbreaks are just days old in terms of their identification. Um, so none at this time. And we have one last question here in the queue this afternoon. It's from Jane Sims at the London Free Press. Uh, Dr. Summers, Southwestern Public Health issued letters of instruction on gathering. Will that be happening anywhere in the Middlesex London region? Uh, great question, Jane. Not yet. The context of Southwestern Public Health is different than Middlesex London at this time. Uh, transmission in the Southwestern Public Health region is highly variable amongst different municipalities um, and largely linked to the overall vaccination status of those communities from my understanding. In the Middlesex London region, we have not seen a dramatic spike. We've seen the gradual increase that in a lot of ways is mirroring what's happening in other parts of the province. If you put the seven day rolling incident rate of London and Middlesex up against the seven day rolling incident rate of a Toronto or Peel, we're following the same trajectory. So a gradual but persistent and real increase in COVID-19 cases. We will be monitoring interventions that are being implemented across the province. We've seen those happen in places like Kingston, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and now Southwestern Public Health. And we'll be monitoring to see which ones are working, as well as looking at our own trends to see if that will be necessary in our region. So not yet. We are not in the same context as Southwestern Public Health. However, I want to highlight transmission is happening. Cases are going up. The weather's getting colder, people are spending more time indoors, and it's the holiday season, which means we're spending more time indoors with people who we haven't been spending time with before. Our social circles, harkening back to a term you would have heard a while ago, our social circles are getting bigger. And they're getting bigger despite the fact that the COVID-19 virus continues to circulate. So I'm just, again, reminding folks, there is no additional public health restrictions right now. However, the rate's going up, it's the holiday season. It's time to keep those gatherings smaller than you would normally keep them. And please, please make sure those that are, you are spending time with are fully vaccinated. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Summers, Dr. Duplo, Mayor Holder, for your participation this afternoon and your insights as well as the valuable information you bring whenever we have these briefings. So that will do it for us for this Monday afternoon. We will be back with our next virtual media briefing that is happening on Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. We hope you will join us then. So between now and Thursday afternoon, have a great rest of your Monday and so long for now.